back everyone to Classic Mario, Remake or Rebreak. This time we're going to be looking at the controversial sequel to Super Mario Bros. Super Mario Bros. 2, and its remake, Super Mario Advance, for the Game Boy Advance. Super Mario Bros. was a huge hit in North America. In fact, for the longest time, it was the highest selling video game ever made. Naturally, when things sell well, a sequel is all but guaranteed. Considering the success of the formula established in the first game, you'd think it would be a cinch to craft a sequel. But the story behind Super Mario Bros. 2 was one riddled with twists and turns. As I mentioned last time, the original Super Mario Bros. 2 was released exclusively in Japan in 1986 for the Famicom Disk System. When it came time for Nintendo of America to localize it, they found it to be incredibly frustrating and were concerned for the future of the franchise. Rather than risk the series' popularity on lost levels, Nintendo of America decided to look for an alternative. Introducing Yume Kojo, Doki Doki Panic, another game on the Famicom Disk System. This title began development as a possible second Mario game, until Fuji Television made a deal with Nintendo to turn it into a game based off of a TV show called Yume Kojo, or Dream Factory. When Nintendo of America refused to localize lost levels, it seemed Doki Doki Panic would be given a chance to be the Mario title it was originally intended to be. I joked about lost levels being the official Super Mario Bros. ROM hack from Nintendo, but in this case that's literally what our Super Mario Bros. 2 was, a graphical hack of Doki Doki Panic. And what's also kind of weird is that after completing the American Super Mario Bros. 2, Nintendo of Japan took the game and repackaged it as Super Mario USA, and sold it right back to Japan. Yup, that's right, the Japanese bought Doki Doki Panic twice. So that brings up an interesting question. Who got screwed over more? The Americans for being given a fake Super Mario Bros. 2, or the Japanese for being sold the same game twice? So, what's the story behind this one? In Mario's dreams, he receives a message from a race of fairies called Subcons, which reside in the uninspiringly named land of dreams, Subcon. Get it? Like, subconscious? <clears throat> the fairies have been captured by the evil Lizard King, Wart, and apparently Mario is the only one who can save them. Mario awakens from his dream and goes on a picnic with Toad, Luigi, and the princess, and up in the nearby mountains they spot the door he saw in his dream. Upon entering the door, Mario and company are surprised to find Subcon sprawling before them. Upon hearing about Mario's dream, the four agree to track down Wart's fortress and free the Subcons. Like last time, I'm going to be focusing on the remake, as most people are already familiar with the NES original. Super Mario Advance greets us with an animated intro, which might seem familiar to some of you, in which Mario, Luigi, Toad, and the Princess left the title screen out of the ground. It's pretty cool, though something that gave exposition on the game's story would have been better. The NES original featured something along those lines, if you waited about 10 seconds without pressing start. It's not a particularly story-driven game to begin with, so I guess it's not that big of a deal. Let's go! Upon leaving the title screen, we see that Super Mario Advance contains a remake of Mario Bros. Arcade in addition to Super Mario Bros. 2. I'll be looking at both, but let's begin with Mario 2. The first thing we're greeted with is a character selection screen. As mentioned before, there are four playable characters in this game. Mario, Luigi, the Princess, and Toad. What's interesting to note is that the NES original was the first game to feature Luigi in his current design. It makes me wonder what Luigi might have looked like if NOA had localized lost levels instead of Doki Doki Panic. Unlike the first game, where the character difference was mostly cosmetic, the player characters in Mario 2 all handled differently. Unlike the first game, where you jumped on enemies to kill them, Mario 2 requires the players to pick up and throw vegetables and helpless baddies to damage enemies. It sounds really basic, but it's actually pretty satisfying. Mario is the most well-rounded of the four. He can pick stuff up relatively fast, run at a reasonable speed, and jump at a decent height. I recommend picking Mario to learn the ropes. Here we go. Luigi has the slipperiest control, but is the fastest, can lift stuff up pretty quickly, and can jump the highest. Princess Peach can't lift things very fast, is pretty slow, but can do a float jump that is incredibly useful for precision platforming. Toad is lightning fast and can lift stuff up almost instantly, but his jump is incredibly nerfed compared to the rest. The princess is by far my favorite of the four. Her floaty jump makes it much easier to land on enemies properly, avoid stage hazards, and make tough jumps. Toad is by far my least favorite. Yeah, he's fast and his lift is good, but as far as platforming goes, he doesn't work very well with this game's level design. Graphically speaking, the game is great looking by GBA standards, though it's worth noting that it reuses the sprites and backgrounds from the Super Nintendo version. It sports colorful and richly detailed environments with well-drawn and well-animated sprites. While the NES version definitely looks better than the first game, it still has dull colors and uninspired looking environments. Clearly, the GBA version looks better. As far as music goes, it's more a matter of taste. 
Those who grew up with the NES version probably have a nostalgic preference for the original 8-bit soundtrack, which is about on par with the first game. Like before, there are only a handful of tracks, the lovely overworld theme, the dull and repetitive underground theme, the invincibility theme from the first game, a decent boss theme, warts boss theme, and a credits theme. My only complaint about the NES soundtrack is that it falls into that Pokemon Generation 1 pitfall, where the tunes are great, but the instrumentation is dull and lacks energy. The Game Boy Advance version, on the other hand, offers creative and whimsical instrumentation that I found to be more engaging to my ears. Like Deluxe, it also features a number of original tracks. In terms of sound effects, Super Mario Advance features voice clips for all four players and the boss characters. That might not sound like a big deal, but it adds a sense of personality that adds to the overall game feel. I think my favorite voice clip would have to be the sound Luigi makes when he gets hit. It's a nice addition that really adds to the presentation and helps give the game a much livelier feel than the NES original. In terms of gameplay, Mario 2 was a much different beast than the first game. The control, in my opinion anyway, is much improved over last time. It's not like the first game controlled awfully or anything, but it took Mario longer to accelerate to full speed than he should have. Here, the characters all walk at a leisurely pace and run at a more breakneck speed. Jumping and mid-air movement feel perfect, though the running can feel a tad slippery at times. The only real flaw I notice is that when climbing vertical shafts, the game suffers from what James Rolfe would call air suspension shit lift. This happens in both the NES original and the GBA remake, which only boggles my mind. Unlike the first game, where power-ups doubled as your life bar, Mario and company can actually take two hits before they kick the bucket. There's also not a pipe, question block, or floating brick to be seen. Instead, the levels are riddled with red weeds, under which are an assortment of vegetables and occasionally potions. The potions are quite valuable, opening gateways to an alternate universe known as subspace. If open in the right places, these doors can lead you to super mushrooms, which add another hit point to your life bar. You can also lift up the grass in these areas to find coins, whose purpose I'll get into later. Instead of pipes, the levels are riddled with bases, which you can climb into to find keys, goodies, and potions. They also feature a track exclusive to the GBA version. Each level also contains five Ace Coins, similar to New Super Mario Bros. Star Coins. Grabbing them all rewards you with an extra life. In this playthrough, I went out of my way to collect them all, and they add a welcome sense of exploration to the level design. You don't really get an end-all reward for finding them all, but they're still a fun side quest nonetheless. The throwing mechanic drastically changes how you interact with enemies, which aren't quite as inspired as the first game. For the most part, they just walk around until you pick them up, and only a few enemies will actually try to attack you. Only one enemy in particular, the Panzer, comes even close to the annoyance factor that Lakitu's or Hammer Brothers conjured up. They throw fireballs, sometimes straight up, other times in arcs, and on rare occasions while moving. These guys can be a pain in the dick, especially when there's nothing to throw at them or they're out of reach. A number of enemies such as Shy Guys, Sniffets, Pokies, Ninjas, Sparkies, and bob would become Mario staples and make reappearances in later titles. In terms of power-ups, the Starman, like the Super Mushroom, also makes a return. Scattered throughout levels are cherries, and upon collecting about five or so, a Starman will sneak its way up from the bottom of the screen. Like before, it'll make you invincible, so I recommend picking up cherries whenever you see them, especially in the NES version. Unfortunately, the damn thing likes to get stuck inside of walls, so be sure that you're standing in an open area when you grab the fifth one. Making a reappearance from Mario Bros. Arcade is the POW block, which will wipe out everything on screen. They're pretty rare, but at the very least, they're fun to use. While these power-ups are useful, most of the time you'll be combating enemies by throwing them at each other. Power-ups are what make Mario so unique and fun to play, and while Mario 2 offers an adequate experience in this department, I don't think it quite stacks up to the first game, or most of the sequels for that matter. The game features 20 levels, spread over 7 worlds, each with a boss waiting for you at the end. While that sounds somewhat meager compared to the 32 level long original, the levels in Mario 2 are much longer and more involved than the original. Each level usually has an overworld section, a cave section, and a couple of base areas. In terms of level design, Mario 2 offers more variety than the first installment. Sometimes you need to stack up mushroom blocks to reach higher platforms. Sometimes you have to jump on trouters or rolling logs to cross chasms. Other times you have to climb up vines, which have the most slippery-ass climbing control you could possibly imagine, or dig down vertical shafts. This variety helps make Mario 2 a more engaging experience than the first game. And now it's time to talk about the difficulty, where the greatest difference between the two versions becomes apparent. In the NES version, there's not a single health-restoring item to be found, except for the Super Mushrooms. You can find hearts, but they only show up when you kill about 10 or so enemies, and they also float up from the bottom of the screen.
screen, which gives enemies more time to kill you. All you get is three lives and two continues, and extra lives are exceedingly rare in this game. When you finish a level, you get to play a bonus game where you can use your subspace coins to bet on extra lives. I can almost never seem to win this damn thing. There's no skill, just pure dumb luck. And unless you can consistently win this bonus game, I don't see any conceivable way that you're beating the NES version. Get nuked by a surprise enemy from off screen and die a third time? Then you've just got a game over, and you're getting sent back to the beginning of the world. Lose both of your continues, and fuck you, you're going back to the title screen to start the game over from World 1-1. In some ways, this is fairer than the first game, which offered only three deaths before forcing you to start from scratch. I was somewhat understanding of the first game's lack of continues for several reasons. One, it was one of the first platforming games ever made. It's not like there was a standard of quality yet. Two, the game had a continue code, and though technically cheating, it at least offered the player a chance to practice running through the levels. Three, the levels were relatively short, so getting sent back to the beginning of the world when you used the continue code wasn't as much of an annoyance as it is in Mario 2. By the time Mario 2 came out in October of 1988, games like Castlevania, Metroid, The Legend of Zelda, and Mega Man had proven that games with unlimited continues and password systems could still be plenty challenging. Hell, even Lost Levels had unlimited continues. It didn't really help all that much, considering that the game was harder than petrified dinosaur shit, but it was the courtesy of it that mattered. And why, for the love of fuck, does getting a game over send you all the way back to the beginning of the world? In a game where you can only get three game overs, isn't getting sent back to the beginning of the level punishment enough? The Game Boy Advance version is a lot fairer when it comes to challenge. For one thing, it offers a save feature. Like the deluxe port, it's as simple as pausing the game and selecting save and continue. You can also find hearts under grass or floating in the air, and hitting two enemies in a row with a vegetable will also spawn one. You're also started off in each level with five lives, and getting a game over only sends you back to the beginning of the level. Unlike Deluxe, where the levels were really short and only had a handful of bosses, Super Mario Advance still offers a reasonable amount of challenge due to its longer levels and more involved platforming. I'm not saying the NES version is necessarily unfair or unplayable because of its limited continues, but at the same time, when I'm playing a game, I don't want to waste my time replaying levels I've already beaten. I realize that what constitutes fair challenge is subjective and a matter of personal preference, but in terms of accessibility and reasonableness, Super Mario Advance clearly has the upper hand. So, on to the worlds. As I said before, there are seven in total and they vary in aesthetic theme. The first world is a bunch of rolling hills and grassy plains. In terms of stage hazards, you can occasionally find logs rolling down waterfalls. At the end of the first two levels, you face Birdo, a pink dinosaur-like creature that shoots eggs from her mouth and wears a red bow in her head. In the NES version, she looks like she has leprosy or something. She also has a very interesting sexual identity. In the Japanese manual, it's implied that Birdo is actually male and is just pretending to be a woman. In a Wii game released only in Japan called Captain Rainbow, you can supposedly find a vibrator in her bedroom. She's also been partnered up with Yoshi on several occasions, notably in Mario Kart Double Dash and Mario Tennis. They make a strange couple, don't they? Birdo's also made appearances in Super Mario RPG, Mario & Luigi Superstar Saga, Paper Mario Sticker Star, Mario Party, and many other spin-off titles. In terms of her role here, she's a pretty fun boss, requiring you to pick up her eggs and toss them back at her. After beating her, she'll spit up a bubble-looking orb and you'll open up this weird hawk face. I always thought that was weird. Most of the games had flagpoles at the end of levels, but Mario 2 has a giant hawk face that eats you. At the end of each world, you'll face a different boss at the end of the castles. In the first world, you face Mauser, whose only other appearance is in Paper Mario on the Nintendo 64. Mauser's only attack involves throwing bombs at you, which say BOMB in their explosions. I've always thought that was strange. The easiest way to finish him off is to grab the bombs in midair and set them in the middle of the platform. That way, he'll always make contact with the explosion. No the second world is a sprawling but mountainous desert, complete with quicksand and sand-filled pyramid caves. In World 2-2, you find Red Birdo, who shoots fireballs in addition to eggs. You can also pull off her bow and throw it off-screen. I've always loved doing that as a kid for some reason. At the end of the world, you find Triclive, a three-headed snake monster, whose voice actor sounds a lot like Beetlejuice. Step right up, if you're ready to get toasted. His main attack involves shooting fireballs at you. The trick is to build up a wall of mushroom blocks and time your throws when he stops shooting at you. The third world mostly takes place in the sky. You gotta be really careful not to slip off all of these clouds. At the end, you fight a boss exclusive to the GBA version. While well, in the NES version, you just fight Mauser again. In the advanced port, you fight Roberto, a giant robotic Birdo. Oh, 
She shoots gigantic eggs at you and causes earthquakes with her stomps. You want to jump up on the chains on the ceiling and land on the eggs when she shoots them. She's pretty tough for a third world boss, taking about 5 hits or so. The fourth world is an icy mountain. I've always hated this part right here, where the level designers thought it would be a good idea to combine ice physics with a barrage of Bezos. I can recommend taking it slowly. At the end, you find Fry Guy, whose appearance in the GBA version is really strange. Just watch. I'm too hot to touch. This boss really chafes my balls. You have to either drop a mushroom block on top of him or throw it at him from the side while he moves around in a pronounced figure eight. Afterwards, he pulls a King Zing and separates into four mini fry guys. These guys are harder to kill than the actual boss. They like to jump all over the mushroom blocks and hit you while you're picking them up. I have no advice to give. The only way to beat him is to have patience and tight reflexes. The fifth world is more mountainous, with the night sky hanging in the background. This is also the point where the game starts to get pretty hard. There are a lot of vine sections and steep drops, so watch out. In World 5-1, you encounter Greenbirdo, who is gray in the NES version. She shoots nothing but fireballs at you, so you're going to have to rely on mushroom blocks to take her out. World 5-3 introduces us to another particularly annoying enemy, Albatosses, who like to drop bob bombs on you from out of nowhere. You're going to need to either grab as many cherries as you can or try to dodge all the shit that's coming after you. The boss of this world is Claw Grip. You make a tasty treat. He reminds me a lot of Donkey Kong, beating his chest with his claws and throwing rocks at you in patterns reminiscent of the barrels in the arcade game. He's not too hard if you can get used to his pattern. Arr, you got me. The sixth world is another desert world. I've always hated this section right here in World 6-1. There's a key hidden in one of these bases. Which one? Well, you pretty much have to rifle around like a dumbass until you find it. Come on, guys, that's not fun level design. The boss of this world is Mauser again, though in the NES version you face another Triclide. He's not all that different from before. And with that, we've reached World 7, which is tough as balls. The level design requires a lot of thought to progress. For example, there's one part where you have to hitch a ride on an Albatross to find the way forward. If you're skilled enough to make it through World 7-1, you'll finally reach Ward's Castle, which is an utter clusterfuck of a level. I can't imagine beating this level in the NES version. I got three game overs on this stage alone, and I've been playing this game since I was about six years old. This level combines conveyor belts with enemy generators, panzers, and a metric but fuck ton of sparkies. Seriously guys, I think this is overdoing it a little. Then you have to kill Birdo to grab a key and enter the final room. Alright, let's pick up this orb and uh... Holy shit, the fucking hawk face is attacking me. Well, he's actually pretty easy, just throw a few mushroom blocks at him and he dies pretty quickly. After entering a door in midair, you finally face Wart. I am the great Wart! Ha ha ha! Wart will walk back and forth and shoot bubbles at you. So how do you kill him? Wart hates vegetables, so you have to grab them as they shoot out of the machine in the middle of the room and throw them at his mouth. Why does Wart have a giant vegetable shooting machine in the middle of the room if they're essentially his kryptonite? Wouldn't that be like if Ganondorf slept with the Master Sword on his nightstand? Because he's always shooting bubbles, you have to time your throw to just before his mouth opens. With luck, your throws will make it, and Wart will croak. <laughs> See what I did there? It's okay to laugh, you know. In the next room, you'll pull the cork off a vase containing the captured subcons. As they drag off Wart's corpse to do god knows what with him, you get an MVP ranking system that tells you how many levels you beat with each character. Turns out I used Peach the most. Go figure. After that, the screen fades to white, and it turns out, it was all a dream. And I should have guessed it, seeing as Subcon was the land of dreams, but the it was all a dream ending is as middle fingerish as you can get, besides maybe Streets of Rage 3's easy mode ending. After beating the game, you can revisit any level you've already beat and find the ace coins you missed. In addition, you can also unlock an extra mode. This mode is similar to the challenge mode featured in Super Mario Bros. Deluxe. The goal is to find all 40 Yoshi eggs, of which two are hidden in each level. You'll have to open up subspace doors in the right place to uncover them, so you really have to comb the levels to find them all. Like Deluxe's challenge mode, this is the sort of thing that would particularly appeal to completionists. But seeing as I've got three more reviews to make after this, I've gotta hurry along. 
finally, let's take a look at Mario Brothers. Mario Brothers! This game was originally released in arcades in 1983 after Donkey Kong, and was eventually ported to NES. I don't exactly have access to the original arcade version, so for this review we'll be comparing the NES port with the GBA remake. You control Mario, running around some kind of sewer. You fight a bunch of baddies called Shell Creepers. Don't follow your instincts and try to jump on them or you just get killed. Instead, you have to bash them from underneath or hit a pal block to knock them over and then kick them off screen. Which is admittedly pretty satisfying. And... that's all you do. Later on, you start seeing new enemies like flying bugs and these crab guys. But overall, this game is pretty underwhelming to say the least. Even by arcade standards. Maybe it was a pretty cool game back in the day. I don't know, but it really hasn't aged all that well. The control is absolutely broken. If you thought Simon Belmont's jump was stiff, then you've seen nothing yet. The big problem is that there's no mid-air movement, so if you jump without moving, you're locked vertically, which makes it harder to jump from platform to platform. And also, if you're at full speed and you jump towards an enemy, then you're screwed because there's nothing you can do about it. In a time before platforms were common, maybe this type of control was more acceptable, but as someone who's well-versed in the genre as it has been since, I find that the stiff control makes the game less enjoyable than it could be. The graphics aren't all that appealing, even by NES standards. Don't believe me? Just look at that bug. Also, these crabs fall victim to sprite flickering, and in my 30 FPS footage it looks like they only have one eye and one claw. I don't know if this is the virtual console's fault or if it was present in the original game, but it still detracts from the presentation nonetheless. There's also no music. None. Whatsoever. Come on, even Donkey Kong had music in the background. Without any sort of sound, the game just sort of drones on. Overall, while the NES version may have been impressive for its time, it hasn't aged very well, and it consequently becomes very hard for me to recommend it. It boggles my mind that someone had to pay $50 to play this game back in the 80s. Hell, the $5 I spent just to show you that minute's worth of footage seems kind of on the expensive side if you ask me. The GBA version, on the other hand, is much, much better. The graphics have been given a tremendous upgrade, and the shell creepers have been replaced with spinies to give the player a clue that you might not want to jump on them. And you can use up to two continues before you have to start over. Mario's control is also much fucking better, thanks to mid-air jump control. And guess what? They actually added music to this version, and it's good music at that. There's no question about it, the GBA version is superior in every single possible aspect. So, remake or rebreak, what's the verdict? I think this game is a shining example of how to craft a good remake. It features all the elements of the original, adds new content, and polishes over problems that were present in the original title. The improved graphics are much easier on the eye, the remixed music is a joy to the ears, the presentation and overall game feel is much more lively and engaging, and the Ace Coins and Yoshi Eggs make this version the clear choice for completionists. In addition, the more reasonable difficulty makes this version a lot more approachable than the NES version, making it a more enjoyable experience overall. The NES version isn't horrible by any means, and for the most part it's aged pretty well, but when these two games are compared on their own objective merits, Super Mario Advance is the definitive version of Super Mario Bros. 2 that I can recommend to newcomers and veterans alike. Those who have mastered the NES version can try their luck at the Yoshi Egg Challenge, or try to grab all the Ace Coins, while newcomers can comfortably beat the game thanks to the save feature and more available health restoration. As for the game itself, Super Mario Bros. 2, despite its interesting past, is a good sequel. One that's even better than its predecessor, in my opinion. The better level design and more interesting bosses help keep things from getting stale. It contains the critical elements of the first game while offering new gameplay mechanics that separated from its predecessor and allow it to stick out on its own. While I still recommend that newcomers check out 3 or World first, I also suggest that they check this one out as well. It's an underrated Mario title that grows on me every single time I play it. So that pretty much covers Mario 2. Join me next time when I take a look at Super Mario Advance 2. Super Mario... World. Not Mario 3? Okay. Join me next time when I take a look at Super Mario Advance 2 for the Game Boy Advance. Until next time, I'm Exo Paradigm Gamer, and I hope you enjoyed the review.